I'm going to do something a little unusual, I think, with this talk, which is I'm going to tell you a story, a personal research story about how experiments in artificial intelligence, in particular in open-ended exploration, revealed something deep about ourselves. So actually implications beyond AI. And I think if you think about it, we should expect no less. Um, because if you think about it, if you're in the pursuit of understanding deep truths about intelligence, and intelligence is one of the deepest truths about ourselves, then ultimately we should learn something really deep about ourselves as well if we're really getting to something profound. Um, and so AGI is not necessarily the only profound implication of discovery in this area. So I wanted to tell you this story and, and show you where it's led. So it goes back a long way, actually. Um, I'll go back to when I was in graduate school and I uh, released this algorithm called NEAT um, with my advisor, Risto Mikulainen, um, way back around uh, 20 years ago. Um, it stands for Neuroevolution of Augmenting Topologies. And at the time, uh, this was interesting because what it allowed you to do is it allowed you to evolve, as used an evolutionary algorithm, increasingly complex neural networks. This is interesting just because you know, it's analogous to how brains actually got more complex over evolutionary time, and it became encapsulated in this artificial system. And if you think you know, 20 years ago, it was actually really interesting to play with a system like that because we weren't used to uh, neural networks becoming increasingly complex as they were used. All right, well, it became um, popular at the time, actually. There were a lot of people using it. And what started to happen um, over the years was that a, a little niche genre of programs, which I would call neat-based genetic art programs, started to come out. Um, this wasn't my idea, but some other people started to create these. Um, uh, there are a couple of the people, just, I, should, I should have put their names, like Mat Matthias Fagerland and Holger, Holger Firstel were, were people who developed these systems. Um, but these neat-based genetic art tools really captivated me because what they did is they put what was inside the network explicitly visually in front of you. And so basically it said, okay, well, a network computes a function, and there's inputs and there's outputs, and what we'll decide to do is make it a two-dimensional function. So there's basically X and Y inputs, and then you can just see what it's, out, what it, what it's computing, the function's computing on a two-dimensional grid, um, or an image, basically. And so then what you could do, because it's neat, is you could breed these things um, as if they were like your, your, your pets or, or it's like a, a breeding farm or something like that. You could pick one and it could mutate it and they could create children. And then you could see what the effects of those perturbations were. But what I thought was fascinating about that was, because, was that you could actually see the effects of complexification um, visually and get an intuitive understanding of what does it mean when the complexity of a network increases um, from an overall kind of function representation standpoint. It's the kind of thing you can't really understand without seeing it. You know, it's not the kind of thing that you can really just impart through mathematics. You really have to kind of see it to get the intuitive understanding. And I personally really enjoyed playing with these things and getting these intuitions. And one, one, of, my, one of my play sessions looked like this. This one affected me a lot because um, I was breeding this spaceship. Um, and you could see that like the network on the upper left, you can see that's, that's where it's kind of the first one that's shown. And then you can see it got more complex over, over this evolutionary uh, run. Um, but also what really captured my attention here is that if you look at it, um, like what happened is that conventions were established, like symmetry, and then respected as new elaborations were introduced. So for example, like if you look carefully, you can see that on, on H there, step H, tail fin suddenly appeared. Now this, this program is nothing about tail fins or anything about spaceships or airplanes or anything like that. It doesn't know anything about anything. These are just effectively random numbers inside of a neural network that are now being fashioned through evolutionary breeding. Um, but what's interesting is both tail fins appeared simultaneously and symmetrically as you would hope they would because they were respecting the underlying symmetries that had been established through the conventions in the network uh, previously. And I thought that, that kind of innovation where you're innovating on pre-established conventions was very reminiscent of like how biological evolution worked. You know, when we see things like we don't have an ancestor who had one leg, right? It wasn't like the one leg was discovered and then later another leg was discovered and you've got two-legged people who can walk. Of course, that's not the way things work. Both were basically developed simultaneously at the same time. And so this is reflecting that and I thought this is just really fascinating. Um, that when you think about the elaboration that happens over time when networks complexify, that it's so reminiscent 
of this other process, um, which is actually somewhat opaque, like why things work in such an interesting way. Well, so <clears throat> we're talking about this um, in, my, in my research group. When I was a professor at the time uh, with the students in the group, and, and I was just saying to them, this is really interesting. Like, this is so amazing. In fact, I, I got to admit, I was like obsessed with this spaceship thing. Like, I, I talked about it for like a year. I told people, this is going to change everything. Like, people are like, it's pretty cool that you got a spaceship, but I don't know if it's going to change everything. Um, but I, just, I just thought this was so interesting. And so one student said, oh, you know what? Um, and his name was Jimmy Secretan. He said, like, why don't we just put this kind of thing like on the web, like a crowdsource it? Like, if it's so interesting, like, like let everybody do it together. Um, like at a website. And what's particularly interesting about that is that then, like, if someone discovered something like a spaceship, that would mean that other people could then take that discovery and breed from there, like standing on the shoulders of your predecessors. So you could branch off other people's discoveries. And I, I was imagining this big tree of life, like, forming, you know, where people are just finding things and then finding things off of the things that other people found. And it just sounded so intriguing. Now, you might say, well, what's the point of all of this? And I don't know yet, but I'm saying this is really cool. We should just do this. <laughs> Let's just see what happens. And so, so we made this website, uh, Pick Breeder, and we let people come in. So let me just show you like, what, what it was like inside of Pick Breeder. So the reason that these blobs look simple is because the beginning of evolution, this is neat. So like, they're very, very small neural networks. We're talking like you know, five, six connections, like maybe a single hidden node or something. That's what you're seeing, functions that are described by things like that. And so, but what you could do is you could pick one, like say I like that one, and, and then you could see what its children looks like, look like. And of course, children resemble their parents, and that's sort of a natural thing when you're breeding. And but sometimes somebody looks a little bit special, perhaps a connection or node was added there, um, and then so that could have children, and then there's obviously a family resemblance again, and so forth and so on, and you're breeding. You know, and, and this is what the, the, the process that this goes through, and of course complexity can go, go up. But what happened, you know, when we let in hundreds of people into the system, ultimately thousands of people, was that like people went from these blobs and these very just just primitive blobs like this is the vast majority of the space, and they brought it up to this kind of stuff, um, and so this is really I thought remark this is absolutely remarkable I thought and still you have to also remember we're talking about old school stuff here this is not modern day Dali right like what we're talking about here it's not image generation from you know 2023 2022 what we're talking about here are each one of these is the output of a single tiny, tiny neural network. So it's like the biggest neural networks here are probably, probably a couple hundred connections, a couple hundred weights. You know, we're talking today, like in modern day, like billions, hundreds of billions. Like this is a couple hundred total. Like most of these are a few dozen, so not even a hundred, um, to produce these images. And this is back like 15 years ago. Um, and yeah, they look like things, you know? Like you can see there's like a butterfly, there's, like a, there's a skull there. Uh, there's Jupiter in the bottom left with its red spot. Um, and, and so it was kind of remarkable that this was consistently happening and being discovered. Um, and clearly something, something was going on here of interest um, as people had come in. Because remember, like the, almost the entire world that this is being discovered in looks like this. Um, and there's no retouching or anything here. This is, this is not artistic depictions. Um, and also, I should mention, it's also really interesting that these are also the result of on the order of dozens of iterations. Now think again, like modern day, you're talking about millions, billions of iterations to get to anything, right, with deep learning. This is dozens of iterations, human-driven iterations, granted, but it's unbelievably small peanuts compared to, to modern day, and yet look what's being found. How is this possible? Well, let me just tell you one other little bit of mechanic. Uh, this doesn't explain ex everything, but this just gives you something you need to know to be explained. And that's the, this branching is going on that I alluded to before, which is basically to say if somebody found something like this face, which is somebody that somebody found at some point, well, then somebody else could say, oh, I like that. I found, you could see it on the website. It's in an archive of discoveries that people had posted. And then you could say, oh, I want to breed that more. And then you get the interfaces back. But now you don't have to start from scratch anymore. You're starting from where somebody else left off. And you just play the game as usual. I could say, oh, I like that variation and so forth. And eventually you could publish it back and things are getting collected. That's where this stuff mostly comes from. So most of these are after many branches. But again, cumulatively, you got like just a few dozen uh, selection steps usually to get from blob to these. Um, and so what I think is, was, what I thought was a very interesting question is how is this happening? I mean, one level you might think, well, 
it's obvious how it's happening. We know they're breeding them, right? Like that's the answer to the question. But at another level, it's really quite remarkable that this is happening consistently with so little computation and also with such minute models, just absolutely infinitesimal compared to today's models. And so actually there's a, deep, <coughs> there's a deeper lesson, there's reason to believe that there's a deeper lesson here than just, oh, it's breeding. Let's just go on to the next thing. And so what is that deeper lesson? Well, it turned out that it's really, really fascinating, actually. There's a profound lesson here, which is that when we look at the top images, and just by top images, I just mean things that look like something. When you look at images that look like something, like the pitcher or the skull or the Jupiter, what we saw was a very consistent pattern uh, on almost every single trajectory that leads to something like this, which is that the stepping stones, the images that you had to get through, the discoveries on the road to where you eventually got, they don't actually resemble the final product. They don't resemble the thing that was ultimately discovered. You know, so look at, for example, that picture there. You see the picture over there. Its predecessor was an egg with a hat. No, an egg with a hat doesn't make you think about pictures. It's not like the person who found the egg with the hat was like, oh, finally we have what we need to get a picture. Um, that's very interesting because what it means is that you can only find things by not looking for them. You know, because think about it, if you were looking for a pitcher, you would not choose the egg with the hat. The reason that the egg with the hat got chosen is because the user who chose it was not looking for the pitcher. That's why we have a pitcher. Or like a dish-like thing leading to a skull, or it looks like a letter G leading to Jupiter, and so forth. Like, the things that lead to the things that you discover that are actually interesting don't look like those things. And so you can only find things by not looking for them inside of this system. Um, and so, if that's counterintuitive, then why is it like that? What is the explanation for this property? Well, it's, it's called deception, which is not actually something new. I also call it the objective paradox. And it's, a, it's a, actually a ubiquitous property of complex spaces. So it's not just pick breeder, and this is why this gets interesting. You know, if this was just pick breeder, then you could sit back, relax, and pick up your phone and think about something else. But you can't do that because the problem is, Think about it, if this property where you can't find things by looking for them is more than a property of just pick breeder, it's a property of your life, then if you are constantly guiding yourself through objectives, you won't do anything interesting at all, right? Because you can only find the interesting stuff by not looking for it. And yet, aren't we completely saturated in objectives in our culture and our personal lives? You know, you gotta get to your OKRs and you gotta start filling out that sheet. And so this is something to actually be worried about if this is true. And if you look at this, you can see why this is a ubiquitous property. Now, deception just means that it looks like you're going in the right direction when you're going in the wrong direction. You're being deceived, or the converse. It looks like you're going in the wrong direction when you're going in the right. You know, for example, like if I get to that donut where I sort of froze it on Gen 20, well, there's no way I would think I'm getting to a skull. It's a donut. Donuts don't look like skulls. It's deceptive. I would actually drop the donut if I wanted to get to a skull because in any picture matching, that's not actually going in the right direction. But it turns out it's directly on the trajectory to the skull, 54 steps later through the space. And so that's deception, and it's a paradox because the problem is that by following the objective, you actually cause yourself to fail to get to it. You know, if I could just take my eye off the ball and forget about the skull, then the donut would be fine. And that's in fact what happened, that the person who found the donut wasn't thinking about skulls. That's why we have a skull. We have a skull because somebody was not trying to find a skull. And we have this objective paradox. It's ultimately because the stepping stones don't resemble the final product. And the reason that I can claim that this is a ubiquitous property in the world and not just about pick breeder is because think about it. If the stepping stones resembled the final product in a hard problem space, a complex space, any complex space, you're looking at a solution to your problem, it has nothing to do with pick breeder. If the stepping stones resembled where you wanted to go, it wouldn't be hard. There's a contradiction. That's basically the definition of a hard problem is we don't know what the stepping stones are. If you do know what the stepping stones are, it's called an easy problem. You'll just solve it. The problem with hard problems is we don't know what the stepping stones are. So they're all going to look like this. This is the actual nature of the world around us. And what it implies is exactly what we saw in Pick Breeder, is that all the great discoveries will be made ultimately because of efforts of people who were not trying to make those discoveries. That doesn't mean that the last iteration, that final move, wasn't made by somebody who cared about it. But all the steps along the road are made by people who don't think about it. Now this insight, very counterintuitive, um, 
led to, at first, algorithmic kind of ideas for, for my group. Like, we were thinking, uh, like, this is so crazy to think about, like, the idea that objectives might actually be bad. And, like, the entire field of machine learning is basically premised on this idea that, like, you follow the gradient towards the objective. Like, this is, like, this is the most obvious thing you should do. So what happens if you create algorithms where you don't do that? This led to kind of new algorithms, like the novelty search algorithm, uh, a field called quality diversity algorithms, which would try to do things like just search for novelty and interesting things and not worry about where they actually ultimately end up. And often it would lead to better performance, like it would be like a, a, a biped robot would just look at different things it could do instead of trying to walk and actually learn to walk better than if it was optimized for walking, for example. Um, and I started to speak at a lot of, uh, conferences uh, in AI and, and machine learning um, because like this was contrarian and people were interested in having controversy and they liked it. But what, what then started happening though, I think is even more interesting than that. Um, like beyond the field, what started to be apparent is that the implications go way out, right? Like if you think about this, like people started saying, well, wait a second, what about me? I have objectives. You know, my employer has objectives. My government has objectives. My institution has objectives. The National Science Foundation has objectives. What does it actually mean? Um, people started saying, and I, I started, occasionally I get invited somewhere really unusual for somebody in my area. Like I, I got invited to the Rhode Island School of Design to talk to artists, because somebody said, I think they'll find, if you talk about this to them, they'll find it interesting. I thought that was really interesting, because I was thinking, well, I had never thought of like talking to artists about these algorithmic points. But like, actually, if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense to talk to artists. Let's show them pick breeder and everything. Like, what, what would they say? Um, and actually, I learned something from these kind of interactions, which was that, like, wow, it's like an emotional thing. It's not just a technical thing. It was like pure catharsis. I got to tell you, like, I had artists, because I had private meetings after, literally on the verge of tears, like, after giving this talk. Not expected at all. Why would they be like that? Because they were saying, I can't justify what I'm doing to my parents. I can't justify what I'm doing to my teachers. I can't justify to my peers. It's like, why don't you just do something that can make money? Like, why are you doing this pointless thing? Even within the field of art, it's like, why this art? When this art is completely pointless, that art would make a lot more sense. It's more symbolically driven or something like that. And all these people had all these complaints. And what I had just spoken about explained why we need people to pursue things even though we don't know where they're going. And that's like self-justifying. So they say, oh my God, this actually is the first explanation we've heard that actually says that what we're doing actually makes total sense. Um, and when I started to realize that, um, I started to realize that this, this point here, you know, to achieve our highest goals, we must be willing to abandon them, um, has a lot more uh, kind of a social gravity to it than just discussing algorithms in AI that actually might be important to discuss. Um, as a social matter, as a cultural matter. Um, and it seemed to me, and at the time my PhD student, Joe Lehman, um, that um, we're never going to get a conversation about that going more broadly if we just publish AI papers. So we said, okay, here's, we'll do something really weird here. We'll write like a book for general audiences about this. There's the pick breeder butterfly on the cover. Um, and just like try to kick off some discussion about the fact that our entire society is saturated with objectives. That's the way that we try to reassure ourselves. That's our security blanket to make ourselves think that we're not going in the wrong direction. But it has this completely undiscussed toxic side effect, which seems like we should be talking about. Um, because the alternative is to sometimes pursue things because they're interesting, even though there's not an objective measure to validate why you should be doing that. Okay, so we said, let's, let's write this book, get this conversation going out there. And of course, then that got me years of immersion into all kinds of communities that I would never normally talk about because then I get invited all over the place to talk to people um, about this matter. Um, so I learned over that time a lot of stuff about how people feel about objectives and the pursuit of objectives in the culture and ultimately that people want serendipity. People are tired of the straitjacket of objectives. It's superficial, it's not valid, you know, if you think about the arguments and the evidence that I just showed you. And yet, we live by it as a goal, as an, as an iron rule. Now, there is a quick caveat, I just wanted to uh, again mention that, of course, if you have a modest objective, none of this applies. Because if you have a modest objective, it means you do know what the stepping stones are. So, you know, it's like you want to have lunch. Well, you can stop by the refrigerator. You don't need to just figure out what's interesting. You can go to the refrigerator because it's modest and you do know what the stepping stones are. 
This is about ambitious objectives. That means things that we don't know how to do. We have no idea what the steps are to get there. So modest objectives we're not talking about here. But when we talk about things uh, that are ambitious, the, the alternative to the objective-based paradigm to get away from the objective paradox is to do stuff where uh, you know, assessment uh, cannot save us because of the, th the point that like, if you look at this performance over time curve, it could be the thing that performs worse, that actually drops you down in performance, whatever your favorite assessment metric is, because we love assessment and metrics, it's all about objectives. It could be the one that puts it down that's more interesting and will be the stepping stone to greater discoveries. That's the interesting technology. Increasing performance is not always right. And so to recognize that stepping stone, you have to actually think outside the box, away from performance, and reward interestingness, which we fear because it's subjective. We don't like subjectivity because we kind of think, uh, think of ourselves proudly as scientists or engineers. But the point is that ultimately subjectivity is all you have to go on when you're deciding what's interesting. That doesn't mean it's random. It just means you have to not have a fear of actually engaging with what makes things interesting. And so there is another way of, of doing things and thinking about things, and this is essential. This is why Pick Breeder actually worked, um, because people were willing to pick things because it was a low-stakes game, just because they're interesting, and there is not a committee sitting there like assessing, like, should you really pick that butterfly? Like, that's not a really good, wise thing for you to be doing here. Like, if you had that, there'd be like basically nothing on the site. Well, so why are all our institutions run almost entirely through objectives? You're thinking about funding organizations, corporations, education, the government, philanthropy. It's like all objectively driven all the time. Everything is measured. The myth of the objective is absolutely everywhere. Well, what can we do? So this brings me to the end. And what I wanted to tell you is like, where does this story recently culminate? What could you do about this? Well, for a while, what I would do about it is just talk to people like this. I'd be having a nice time just telling people about it. And I got to know a lot about how people feel about this. Um, but I start to feel like around last year, it was after like seven years of talking about this after the book came out, I was like, I just gotta be something more to do than just talk. Like just talking about it. It's like, what can we actually do about it? You know, and I just thought, okay, well, if you think about this, the, the ideas that I'm describing to you sound a little like a new age philosophy or something. It's like follow the interesting, you know, it sounds a little bit like a philosophy. But the thing is, it's not philosophy because it grounds out in originally in empirical scientific experiments and systems like the pick breeder system, the novelty search algorithm, the field of quality diversity, like there's actual things that were actually concretely implemented. This is not new age philosophy. So shouldn't it be possible then if those concrete things lead to these high level ideas that we could actually complete the circle and come back to the concrete things? In other words, couldn't we make a system that exhibits these properties and encompasses people within it so that the world would be more serendipitous, which ultimately is what the book, you can, if you think about what a non-objective principle is, it's about serendipity, the conditions that lead to discovery without knowing where you're going. So couldn't we make a system that then encompasses people into a giant serendipitous kind of intentional organized system? And so we decided to make this completely new kind of online service that respects this principle of serendipity and the objective paradox. And we're calling it Maven. Um, and we got it started, we got it funded. Um, it's a company now. Um, and I don't think we're ready to give too much detail, which is why you're like, well, what exactly do you do? And I didn't tell you. Um, but we, we are gonna be coming out soon. And if you are interested in more information or you wanna test it or you want to work with us, uh, you could email me if you'd like to, or you could also find me through the web or through uh, Twitter or those ways. And I'd be happy to tell you more and perhaps let you get us off the ground. So hopefully Maven will be the embodiment of this principles in a much uh, broader sense than something like just pick breeder. And so thank you. And I guess I could take a couple questions.